Are you going to have the little... Uh, Hey guys, and welcome to the Journey DBT podcast. This is episode six, I believe. It's not Check the Facts. I did not change that. We're actually going to be doing willfulness versus willingness and problem solving. Uh, so we are the Journey podcast. This is Hooter at the top. We have Maria, me, Electra, and Lexi and I will put their socials down in the description of our YouTube video um, so first and foremost we are not medical professionals uh, this content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice diagnosis or treatment always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have read on this website. If you are in crisis, call 911. There's also the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and the Crisis Text Line, both of which are anonymous. There you go, Maria. All right. Um, now, what is DBT? It is dialectical behavioral therapy. It's a type of cognitive behavioral therapy. Its main goals are to teach people how to live in the moment, develop healthy ways to cope with stress, regulate their emotions, and improve their relationships with others. DBT was originally intended to treat borderline personality disorder but it has been adapted to treat other mental health conditions. It can help people who have difficulty with emotion regulation <clears throat> or are exhibiting self-destructive behaviors such as eating disorders and substance use disorders. And this type of therapy is also sometimes used to treat post-traumatic stress disorder. Right, it's DBT, anybody can use DBT. You don't have to have a specific medical diagnosis uh, it's really good for everybody to learn this even kids um, definitely highly recommend just getting to know the skills it could also help you know if you know somebody that suffers from uh, a psychiatric condition to help them not something like that even if you don't have mental health issues that would be nice <laughs> but it, it's just a lot of it's interpersonal stuff like mm -hmm. teaching us how to interact with other people and it can be helpful not even just for the mental health side of it should teach it in school i think they yeah took a lot of the absolutely. mindfulness stuff and gave it scientific terminology and you know gave some backing behind it that it's not you know just some crazy hippies and stuff it's there's actual like science behind it yeah this works absolutely it does work and Lexi do you want to read what is mindfulness mindfulness is a mental state achieved by focusing one's awareness on the present moment while calmly acknowledging and accepting one's feelings thoughts and bodily sensations and it's used as a therapeutic technique that makes it sound almost like out of reach or something or like something that only a therapist can do for you i don't know it's it's not like that like it's i'm not trying wait i'm sorry i'm not trying to say your slide is bad i'm just like no oh, you're well, fine no, put, it in, put it in your own words <laughs> So what I is, mean, it's it's phrased well. It's just you know a way of looking at the world and being here right now and trying to like put yourself into whatever situation you're in a hundred percent instead of like being lost in your head, focused on the past, anxious about the future. Um, if you're just in the present right now, which is all that we have anyway, um, life becomes a lot better. I think. 
Right, so what is an example of mindfulness? I would go with, you know, mindful eating, whatever it's, it's so many times my husband and I, we get um, dinner and then we're like, okay, what do you want to watch? And before I know it, the plate's gone, you know? And I didn't even really taste anything because I was too busy watching TV. Whenever you sit down and you eat mindfully, it really makes a difference in not just the uh, pace that you're eating at because you're eating mindfully, but also you get more sensation out of it. You get more um, taste, more, more everything out of it whenever you do something mindfully. You can use all five of your senses. I know when we, the group that we were in together before it went all online, uh, when someone would graduate, they usually would have like a fruit plate and the exercise for that last day was mindfully eating for the first few minutes, focusing on the way it tasted, the way it felt in your mouth, the way it smelled, listening to yourself eat. And then everybody talked about feeling so, you know, it's like, wow, I didn't realize it sounds like I'm so loud when I'm chewing. Right. So, like, for example, I have this can of Monster. So, instead of just jerking it open and chugging it, it's like, oh, there's condensation on the outside. It's cold. You know, you feel the can. You know, listen to the sound that it makes and the sound that it makes when you open it. <laughs> <laughs> I just got that all over my eyes. <laughs> and then you smell it. Like, who smells their food? Seriously. We just yeah. open our drinks, we get our food, and we shove it in our mouths. And it's like, you know, <laughs> I can attest my fiance when he had COVID in December, when we both did, it was miserable because we couldn't taste any of our food. And it becomes a point where you're like, I forgot the food actually smelled good as well, uh, as well as tasted good. Yeah. So that's mindfulness. Okay. And Hooter, do you want to read uh, what is wise mind? Oh, sure. Wise mind is, 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 oh, wise mind is the state of mind in the middle of both logical and emotional mind. In wise mind, we are aware of our feelings and we decide how to act in a way to honor our feelings and goals. In wise mind, if we are angered, we would acknowledge our feelings and act in a way that would not create negative consequences for ourselves. So like, it's like a balance walking the middle path between rational mind where you're like Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory or Spock from, uh, from Star Trek or, you know, being emotional, like, you know, uh, I guess I just, I'm always emotional. I can't even think of characters. Maybe Harley Quinn, she always acts on her emotions, but going right in the middle where you can, you know, think before you act. I think that a lot of times it's the whole uh, part about letting, you know, it's like and something happens, you think about it, and then you act, like then the emotions come or instead of the other way around. Right. Yeah, and I always say that I'm very emotional mind. I'm trying to do better about thinking before I do something. But before DBT, I just always acted on my emotions. I'm still at that point, mostly. But yeah. at least now I'm getting to where I recognize a lot of my problematic thought patterns or what have you. Well, I mean, I think I that's the whole point of the DBT. Logic, you have to keep practicing it because at first it's really hard. And if you keep practicing it, eventually it'll start to come along. It's not, you know, with everything, it's not like, oh, you just suddenly know how to do it. You've got to have it there and practice it like, like any other skill. No, absolutely. And like, none of us are perfect. Like we've been in group therapy for a while and we all still struggle. Like I had a really bad night last night. So I'm using a lot of skills today just to be here. Um, just to like get up and put makeup on and go do the stuff that I need to do. So it doesn't make you perfect. It just helps you uh, with your day to day. 
Okay, and Maria, do you want to read the stop skill? Sure. So this is a skill that I think a lot of us use quite a bit um, because it is so helpful and, and I really appreciate it. So the stop stands for, first off, stop. Don't just react. Stop. Freeze. Do not move a muscle. <clears throat> Your emotions may try to make you act without thinking. Stay in control. The T stands for take a step back. So take a, the, one, the therapist actually was talking about how that you can literally, you know, take a step back to get your mind to take a step back from that situation. Take a break. <clears throat> let go. Take a deep breath. Do not let your feelings make you act impulsively. The O is for observe. Notice what is going on inside and outside you. What is the situation? What are your thoughts and feelings? What are others saying or doing? And the last for P is proceed mindfully. Act with awareness. In deciding what to do, consider your thoughts and feelings, the situation, and other people's thoughts and feelings. Think about your goals. Ask wise mind <clears throat> which actions will make it better or worse. So if you can't, like if you're in a situation where you're in um, with a lot of people, you can use the stop skill by just excusing yourself to go to the bathroom. You know, just just get remove yourself from the situation so you can think about it and not get so caught up in emotion mind that you do or say something you'll regret later. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a really helpful skill. And I, I think it's one of the first that we learned. I mean, after mindfulness, that was kind of the first, I think, but it's hard to do any of the other skills if you don't first stop and mm -hmm. do it. I know, sorry, one of y'all said that at some point and I just totally hijacked it. No, that's um, fine. The easy part, or well, not easy, but one of the good parts about DBT, like in group settings, usually mindfulness is the module that you come back to a lot. When they add someone new, they'll always go back to the mindfulness before they'll start on another module. So you get that, uh, the stop skill, the wise mind skill, all those basic mindfulness ones, that's one that you hammer on occasion, like a lot. Yeah, this is one that everybody, regardless of who you are, children should know how to do this. And it's something that I saw on like PBS or one of those after school specials. They went over this, you know, not in the exact words, but, you know, counting to 10 and thinking about the situation before you act. And I totally forgot to make this better. But what skills, uh, observing, describing, participating, um, so you observe the situation, you describe the situation, and you participate. Uh, another good what skill is if you're having a panic attack, you can go over your five senses. So you find something that you can feel, you find something that you can taste, smell, um, hear, see, uh, so like I was having a panic attack, uh, somebody took me outside, I was looking at the stars and smelling the fresh cut grass and feeling the rocking chair, um, so things like that can help you, especially if you're having anxiety. Rachel? Or, sorry, Lexi. Um, what? You want me to read this? Is that? Yes. <laughs> I got confused. Think start. Okay. I'll just do it. This is so we can change our ineffective emotions by acting opposite to the emotion. So, for example, um, if you're fearful, you might want to either freeze, run, avoid, like the fight, flight kind of thing. Um, opposite action would be to just go through that fear anyway and approach it. If you're really angry, you might want to hit somebody or yell or 
just verbally attack them. Opposite action would be to take a step back, gently avoid them, maybe even do something nice. If not for them, maybe it's somebody else or just for yourself. Like, just don't be so freaking angry and take it out on them. Sadness. Of course, we want to cry and isolate, withdraw. I'm really bad about that, like, even when things aren't really bad. So, yeah, opposite action, get active. Um, that's why I'm here today. <laughs> opposite action. Um, and then if you're feeling guilty or shameful, instead of hiding and avoiding it, you know, just face it, go through it, fight through the fear, and you'll come out on the other side feeling not only, like, you know, I think hopefully the situation would be better, but also you'll feel better about yourself because it's just another time that you showed yourself that you can do it. You can. Oh, I know. Doodle nice. is like gifting subs to everybody. That's so sweet. Thank you. Yeah, That's thank you. Cool. Thank you guys. I appreciate everybody. Thank you, Doodle, and thank you, Klein. You're gonna be in trouble later. Oh, what um, exactly that's sub to. <laughs> so they're sub to the channel. Uh, okay. So people gift subs, uh, and what I'll do is any money that's donated uh, during our mental health streams i'll donate to a charity and then post it online uh the four of us will decide which charity that goes to it'll be mental health related so i really appreciate you guys awesome okay let's see give me just one second I'm trying to see so me and maria We'll read these. So the tip skill, tip skill is really good uh, for changing your body chemistry. Um, when you're in crisis, a skill can snap you back to reality. It really works. Uh, try keeping a bag of frozen peas, a bottle of water, ice pack, etc. in your freezer for emergencies. Uh, if you're out and about, just water helps. Anything cold uh, that you can press against your face. So the tip skill, it's to reduce extreme emotion mind fast. Uh, so you do it in this order. You tip the temperature of your face with cold water or whatever you have that is cold. You hold your breath for 30 seconds and you put your face in a bowl of cold water or whatever you have that's cold or hold a cold pack on your eyes and cheeks and you hold it there for 30 seconds so you're wanting to make sure to cover your eye and your nose and your mouth and what it does is it initiates that dive response um, and it calms your body down if you take your pulse before you do this and after you'll notice that your pulse is slower your breathing slower so after you do that you're going to want to do intense exercise go for a walk uh, do some jumping jacks run on the treadmill you are trying to expend your body's energy um, once you do the exercising you're going to want to do the paced breathing so deep breathing um, meditation body scan which the body scan <laughs> is really the last part it's the paired muscle relaxation relaxation you guys got me flustered <laughs> so while breathing into your belly deeply tense your body muscles not so much as to cause a cramp you're just tensing your muscles notice the tension in your body while breathing out, say the word relax in your mind and let go of the tension and notice the difference in your body. And you do that with each, you know, muscle. Like I start at my feet and go up. That's just how I do it. You can also go on YouTube and look up uh, body scan meditation and that will help. 
it's really helpful for me too to fall asleep at night because like once you tense yourself up and then let it go somehow it it makes it so much more i don't know it's like you let go further than if you i don't know i'm not explaining it well but it's nice do it check it out <laughs> you explained it perfectly silly uh, these are just two crisis resources, Suicide Prevention Lifeline and Crisis Text Line. Both are confidential. You can now text to both of these places uh, and get a response back. Definitely save those in your phone. Uh, can be useful for you or a friend. And then we have Check the Facts. Uh, Maria, do you want to read Check the Facts? And you don't have to read it verbatim. Okay. All right. So I, I've been using um, Check the Facts a lot this past week, and it is really helpful whenever you're in stressful situations because it brings you back to not just what your, your brain is telling you, but to what's real and what's factual. So um, first off, you want to ask yourself, what is the emotion that I want to change? And uh, being able to identify your emotion is the first step in this, which is something that I, I sometimes have a hard time doing, identifying exactly how I'm feeling. But uh, the second thing you want to do is what is the event that is prompting the emotion? So whenever you're sitting down and you're thinking of whatever the event is, you want to describe that event, describe the facts of that event <clears throat> through... Um, observing your senses and then challenging those judgmental thoughts and the black and white thinking trying to challenge those um the third thing you want to do is what are my interpretations thoughts and assumptions about the event so um try to look at the event from other possible interpretations including all sides of the situation and all points of view. That one can be really hard to do, um, but it's definitely one that'll help you with checking the facts. Number four is, am I assuming a threat? Label the threat and, uh, and assess the probability that it will actually occur. Think of as many other possibilities as you can. What is the catastrophe? So imagine that a catastrophe is really occurring and imagine coping with that catastrophe using your skills such as problem solving, coping ahead, um, radical acceptance. And then the last one is, does my emotion or intensity or duration of that emotion fit the facts? So after you've gone through all of these, you might have to go back over and do them again two or three times until you realize what the facts truly are of the situation and if it warrants your reaction. Right. And so my example for this is I used to be so bad about text messages, any kind of message, if... I messaged somebody and they didn't mess me, message me back, my mind would automatically jump to the worst possible outcome. I'm like, okay, they don't want to talk to me. They don't like me. They wish that I would not text them. Um, I need to stop texting this person, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm making up all these scenarios in my mind and my therapist is like, but how do you know that? Do you know that they don't want to talk to you? Do you know that they don't like you? No, because you don't have those facts when, you know, they could be out with family, uh, don't have their phone, you know, things like that. And I have gotten better about it, um, but... I still have to check the facts for just certain things. I, I'm so bad about jumping to the worst possible outcome. I'm sure that you guys have experiences like that. For I sure. I like this, that experience, definitely. Yeah, and 
like another girl in our group she had her husband who was late coming home uh so she was like oh my gosh he got in a car accident and she didn't have the facts she didn't know if he really got in a car accident or not so that's another uh example of checking the facts because you don't have all the information so you want to go through these and it really does calm your emotion it brings you back to that wise mind instead of uh just flying off the handle yeah i've been in that same exact situation i was like he's dead what am i gonna do i was like already trying to figure out where to go from there like he had already died in my mind ridiculous oh yeah <laughs> I've done the same thing with Mark. I mean, I'll go so far as to call hospitals and, you know, see if there's been a wreck. Call the police. Has there been a wreck? Has there been, a, you know, a murder or anything like that? I've jumped to the worst case scenario a lot. Absolutely. Let me see if I can. Well, sometimes, like, to be prepared. I guess that's why our minds do that when you go through a lot of shit like get used to it and you want to be ready for whatever's coming at you but you can definitely get out of control no absolutely um let me see here so Lexi you were going to do uh, problem solving and for some reason my slide cut off the S for step. Can you still read that? <laughs> Don't you just love technology? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why that happened. One, we want to first identify. You can't know what you're dealing with. I mean, you can't deal with it unless you know what you're dealing with. So, yeah, figure it out. Describe the problem situation. And then we're going to use the check the facts all the facts to be sure you have the right problem situation. If your facts are correct and the situation is the problem, continue with step three. If your facts are not correct, go back, repeat, step one and step three. So this is step three. Just do it all again. Just, yeah. <laughs> um, identify your goal in solving the problem. Um, I guess that means like, don't just be like, oh, I want to fix it. Like how, how does fixing it look to you? Like make sure you have a clear idea. Here, I'll just um, bring up the identify what Identify what needs to happen. I think I have the same thing. Oh, it's a little different than what you had up. There it is, nice. Okay, so identify what needs to happen or change for you to feel okay. Keep it simple and choose something that can actually happen. Don't get crazy with it. Um, step four, brainstorm. Lots of solutions. Think of as many solutions as you can. Ask for suggestions from people you trust. And at first, don't try to not be critical of any of your ideas. Wait for step five. That reminds me of a story about Walt Disney. Like, he, I don't know, something about that. Like he would just come up with all the ideas and then be like, okay, let's, let's eliminate some of these. And he's pretty successful, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so brainstorm. And then step five, choose a solution that fits the goal and is likely to work. If you're not sure, uh, narrow it down. Choose two that look good. Do pros and cons to try to figure out what would be best. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> um, Compare the solutions and then choose the best to try first. Step six, put the solution into action. Act, <laughs> try out the solution. Take the first step and then the second, just start trying. And then step seven, evaluate the results of the solution. If it worked, yes, we did it. If it didn't work, it's okay. Just go back to step five and choose a new solution to try. Absolutely. And I remember when we first did this, we were all talking about how our houses were a mess. Spoiler, <laughs> we're not perfect. 
Uh, so our houses were a mess. So we kind of worked on this together and we were like, okay, so figure out and describe the problem situation. Our houses are messy. Uh, check the facts to be sure you have the right problem situation. Yeah, pretty sure. Like, I can see it. Um, identify your goal. Uh, we want to clean our house. Brainstorm lots of solutions. And everybody in the group was like, you know, put on music. Uh, Maria said set a timer. And then I think it was Maria that, that was like... So good. We could do it together. So we actually ended up cleaning that night, like, together. Uh, Maria set a timer. She's like, just do everything that you can in this amount of time. And that was such a positive experience in group and just made it feel like we were working together. Um, so that's, like, one of my favorite memories of all of us Aww. that's so sweet oh, that's <laughs> yeah <nice. laughs> because... my house is still a mess though it's really bad yeah. <laughs> well that's one of those problems that continuously comes up so you get to practice on that skill yeah <laughs> no absolutely so this is really good and it is good to work with other people um to do that Okay, Hooter. I feel like we should have a little owl sound whenever it's your turn to talk. <laughs> okay, so willingness versus willfulness. Uh, willingness is the skill of realizing that you are part of and connected to the rest of the universe. Willingness is playing your part as best you can with what you have at this point in time. Willingness is a commitment to actively participate in your part of the cosmic process and allow the world to be what it is, no matter what happens. Your willingness to be able to bring the attitude like for full participation in your life. Um, willfulness is disconnecting from your wise mind and the opposite of will willingness. If uh, willingness is realizing you're part of and connected to life, then willfulness is denying reality, refusing to be part of the cosmic process, or just giving up hope. Um, willfulness is saying no to life itself, saying no to reality, and saying no to what is. Um, if you experience... I clicked off there for a sec. Um, if you experience willfulness, turn your mind back to radical acceptance, which is something I know for myself personally. I always have to remind myself that I at least need to try. Um, I, I've heard a, a couple of therapists before say if anything's worth like doing, you know, at least even half-ass doing, then you should try at least to do it, as opposed to you know just going. Well, what's the point? Why should I even try? Absolutely. <laughs> Let's see here. I'm trying to think of. Does anybody have an example for this one? Um, a big one to me is just the willingness to continue doing DBT, even if it doesn't connect for you right away. Uh, your first session's not going to be some magical, like, oh my gosh, I am suddenly better. I just, I, everything makes sense now. I'm perfectly well. It's like, there's a reason why you have to practice things and you have to be willing to, uh, you always have to be willing to go to therapy if you want to get better. You need to be willing to take your meds. You've got to be willing to go through a checklist and take care of yourself if you're not even, you know, if you're being willful and just, you know, saying to yourself, why should I try? No one's going to force you out of that comfort level. You have to do that yourself. You have to be willing to do it. And there's nothing in the universe that's going to make you be willing to do it until you do that yourself. Absolutely. Very well said. Yeah, very well it said. It reminds me of addiction a little bit or... Um, even an eating disorder, whatever it is, like a problem behavior. Um, like a lot of times, you know, if you know someone dealing with that, you want to help them and you want to just grab them and pull them out of it and make them feel okay. But unfortunately, like, and I know because I've been that addict, um, it's not going to happen until they're ready. So, what is the saying? You can drag a horse to water, but you can't force them to drink. Right? 
trail. Absolutely, and and it does take time. It's not. It's not going to magically cure you just by going to therapy or just starting off medication. For medicine, it can take two to six weeks for it to start working and for you to notice the difference. And that's the same way it is with therapy. It takes, I think, three weeks to make a habit. Um, and, you know, DBT is a little, uh, what's the word? daunting at first um, when you get into it but the more you get into it and it starts to click it may take two or three times going over these skills but once they start to click you start using them and not thinking about using them um, and like I said you know at the beginning it's it's not perfect none of us sitting up here are perfect uh, or we wouldn't be in therapy. <laughs> We're just trying to learn these skills and, you know, give these resources to other people um, so that we can reach out and do our part in trying to help the community. Uh, but we're still not perfect. We still have to practice and do our skills. You know, that's how it should be with everything. I know it's a whole can Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, I know for me, it took me almost a year to really start applying everything. Um, I was going to the meetings and, and stuff like that, but I hadn't really started doing the homework and stuff like that. It took months for me to get into it. And it really does make a difference if you stick with it. It does. And, um, we also, Aaron made a DBT Discord. I definitely recommend anybody that's interested in uh, DBT to come and join the Discord. Uh, we have a lot of resources. Like I said, we're not medical professionals, uh, but we'll be there for you and help you find some resources. So I just put that link down in the chat. Uh, just click it, join it. We're down to earth people. We make mistakes, but we'll be there for you. DBT can be really overwhelming in the beginning because you have so many things. And a lot of the times you don't even start to realize that you're using skills. Um, I know that's why in a group setting, usually having someone who's a licensed professional to lead the group really helps mm -hmm. because they're trained, they've gone through this, they know it's like, no, you used this skill when you did this and you're going, really? Oh, oh, that's awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah, absolutely. Or you don't, don't know, know the name of the skill, but you're still using that. I mean, it's like all stuff. You've got to practice it and keep going back and doing it again and again. Yeah, just sticking like, with it. When I first um, started trying to get better or whatever, and I started going to therapy and meetings and whatever else, like I just wasn't ready. I was still just just rolling around in the depression and like just so sure that I couldn't be helped. And so it didn't help me because I was kind of just stubborn about it internally. Like I said, I wanted to get better, but I would like do a couple shots before going into therapy. Like what the hell? So yeah, but then years and years later, um, I guess it was about a year ago, I started going to individual therapy and then maybe six months ago or so it was, I finally got into the group with you guys and I'm so grateful because honestly, I think it's helped me more almost than the uh, individual therapy because it really helps to like have that support network around you and thank you hooter for like making the discord because it's an amazing community i'm just glad i'm still able to interact with you guys after i graduate from the class i know for myself knowing someone else is going through the same things as me is a lot easier i mean it's always nice to have your therapist um i actually have a best friend who's a therapist who occasionally she has to take breaks from work when she does her own mental health care stuff and it's one of those things where it's like 
oh, wow, but you're a therapist. Why would you need to take a break? And she's like, I need to go see my therapist. And it's like, oh, that's so cool. But I mean, I guess like with the willingness stuff, you know, we need to participate in our therapy, mm -hmm. knowing what kind of therapy works better for you, which, you know, also being active in your meds, knowing what kind of meds you're getting. I know a lot of times people just say you don't need to ever question your doctor, but I mean, that's a really important thing. If you start to notice that certain meds don't work with you, you can do the research and speak to your doctors and be like, hey, this isn't working out for me. I'd like to try this. And they can tell you why maybe they haven't given it to you before, or they might be like, hey, yeah, I hadn't considered that. Let's try that one. No, you have to be your own advocate. You have to be your own advocate. Because if you don't, you know, you may get stuck with something you don't really want or need. I, I know for me, um, I had to be my own advocate whenever it came to getting on a medication for nightmares. It took me about six months to actually get the medication because I was relentless. <laughs> <laughs> and it helps. Yeah, the absolutely. other part of being willful is like not just going to therapy and or trying medication or whatever it is but also but be willing to not give up on yourself like try a different therapist um you know try a different medication don't just throw your hands up like i did and just be like well guess i'm destined to just feel like shit every moment of my life because you're not it can definitely get better so just be willing to like keep trying of always important i know a lot of people in therapy are like you know i don't like my therapist i therapy's not for me and it's like you can ask your th your providers to give you a different therapist and if not, then you can try and go to another office. But I mean, I found there's just certain people like your ideals don't click together. I've had therapists in the past who are who are like, you know, you know, telling me it's like, well, you know, your your significant other needs to be paying for all of your stuff. And I'm like, that's not my own personal thing. And she's like, but that's, you know, something. And I mean, this was in the South. So she was saying, you know, that's a woman's place in the Bible. And she's like, you need to be going to church if you want to get better. And for me, I was like, I don't want to do that so i realized you know it's like you and i might not work out because we don't have the same religious beliefs so i asked and i got a different therapist yeah you have to date your therapist and make sure that you click and you have a relationship my last therapist was amazing and now i'm on the hunt for a new one because she switched practices um but i also want to say make sure to check your whole body health um for a long time i was sleeping for uh crazy amounts periods and just getting sleepy all the time and having to take naps and i thought that it was depression when in fact uh, the psychiatrist recommended that i go to a sleep doctor and i found out that i actually have narcolepsy so oh, God. sleep disorders are a part of depression, but you want to rule out everything. You know, your thyroid can uh, wreak havoc on your mental state. Your sleep can. So I do recommend, you know, also talking to your regular doctor and just ruling out anything else medically going on with you. Because for a long time, I, start, I suffered with narcolepsy, and now I'm being treated for it, and it's starting to get better. Um, we're just still trying to get me to sleep at night, which is crazy. There's a lot of things about narcolepsy that I've learned. Um, it's People in narcolepsy, they don't just sleep all the time, and it's good sleep. Uh, they go into REM state and have dreams a lot um which makes you really tired if you're not getting that other sleep so just rule out everything and don't give Even up your blood sugar can affect um everything when i went to emory i was trying to get um on some medication and they were they did blood tests and they're like your sugar levels are too high and that's when i found out i was diabetic um 
when I have my sugars under control, I usually feel a lot better. I've had my own endo- uh, endocrinologist say, you know, if you don't have your sugars under control, it can spiral you into depression. Or if it's too high, it can also make you a little bit, you know, crazy because you've got so much energy. Absolutely. Yeah, just check your whole body and don't give up. Just, there's, you're going to get through it and figure it out. Just keep going and, you know, rule out everything. Find a good therapist. Keep it up. It It's not a mag, there's no magic pill. Um, and we'll be here every Thursday, God willing, 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, the videos go up on YouTube usually the same night. Please share. We're trying to reach as many people as we can and help them. Uh, anybody else have anything else they want to say? I think that's everything. If anyone in chat has any questions, yeah, I, ask like, anytime. Yeah, or if you're on YouTube later watching, like feel free to leave a comment and we'll like address it in the next one. Absolutely. That's something that I'd love to do. Maybe uh, over the next week on social media, uh, you know, whoever has an account can ask for questions and we'll answer them in the next video. So if you have a question, just DM it to us, tell us in the Discord, uh, put it in the chat, put it on the YouTube video, whatever, and we'll try to answer it. Thank you for being here. We love you. Uh, you know, have a good week. Take care of yourself. First and foremost, you have to take care of yourself before you can take care of other people. So make sure to do something nice for yourself today. See you guys. Bye. Bye.